Welcome back to our series on the Psalms. So this week we're going to be looking at the darkest collection of the Psalms, which we call the imprecatory Psalms. Uh, the imprecatory Psalms are curses, or that's what an imprecation is. It's a curse. And this is, of course, what makes them difficult, is that they are focused on cursing enemies. Um, and it's not always just God's enemies, too. We'll see in some of the imprecatory Psalms uh, that the the cursing is very personal. All right, but we'll, we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, but what makes this, this genre of psalm difficult is that they seem to run completely counter to some of the things that we learn in the Sermon on the Mount and just in the Gospels in general. Um, and Jesus tells us like not to resist the evildoer, uh, to turn the other cheek, to offer to give our oppressors even more than what they're trying to take from us. He teaches us, you know, bless those who curse you. And Paul expands on that in Romans 12, 14. He says, bless and do not curse them. Uh, James does something very similar in uh, his teachings on the tongue in James chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. He says, with it, that is with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So it would seem to us that the imprecatory psalms just run counter to the gospel and that they're just off limits for Christians. Um, and unsurprisingly, many Christians treat the imprecatory psalms in this way. We more or less pretend that they don't exist. Um, because it just, again, it looks like a clear black and white sort of thing. It, it almost strikes us like almost like the dietary laws. It, it, it's something that has changed in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, except in an even more restrictive sense. Um, whereas with a lot of things from the Old Testament, like circumcision, like the dietary laws, like the uh, restrictions on clothing, we say you know that under the New Covenant, we are not constrained by those things. In the case of the imprecatory Psalms, we act like in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, things have actually grown more restrictive, that Israel was allowed to offer up these kinds of curses against their enemies, but we are not because, because something fundamentally has changed. But let's complicate things just a little bit. Right? That, that view of the imprecatory Psalms, that view of curses, um, and how they're handled in the New Testament, I think is a little overly simplistic. We should remember, first off, that curses abound in the New Testament just as well as in the Old Testament. Um, in Acts chapter 8, for example, we see Peter tell Simon the Magician. You remember, Simon the Magician was this, uh, he was this guy who converted to Christianity, and he saw the apostles giving the gift of the Holy Spirit by laying on their hands, and Simon goes up to the apostles and asks if he can buy that ability from them. And you remember what Peter tells Simon the magician? He says, may your silver perish with you because you thought that you could obtain the gift of God with money. Now, Peter combines this with a call to repentance almost immediately after that. And that's crucial. All right, we'll have more to say about that in just a second. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that Peter has begun his response by saying, I hope you and your money both die. That's what he says, right? May your silver perish with you. I hope you and your money both die. It's a curse, right? Paul, likewise, in Galatians chapter 1, says that anyone proclaiming a different gospel than what has been received is to be accursed. And in Galatians chapter 5, towards the end of the letter, Paul lays down his own curse, uh, in chapter 5, verse 12, Paul says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. All right, and that's a curse if I've ever heard one. Uh, James, for his part, you know, we've, uh, we read the, uh, 
you know, his admonition against cursing in James chapter 3, in James chapter 5, he launches into a harsh polemic against the rich. You know, how you rich for the miseries that are coming upon you. So it seems that our first answer, our knee-jerk reaction, that imprecations are just inherently sinful and completely off-limits to Christians is not quite the full story. Uh, because the, the New Testament, along with all the scriptures, hold these two ideas together in tension, that we should not return evil for evil, but that we should also desire God's judgment against the wicked. Um, in, at least in some limited sense, we should desire that. Right? We find that tension express, expressed most fully at the cross. Because, of course, why did Jesus die? Well, he died that none should perish. Right? Uh, he died so that all could receive forgiveness of sins and not have their sins held against them. And yet, the, the cross is also a stumbling block. It's a scandal. There are people who disbelieve on the basis of the cross. Right? Paul tells us as much in 1 Corinthians. Many reject the cross and face God's wrath because of their rejection of the cross, because they reject the very thing that is intended to save them. It leads to their damnation. We see this, this division at the crucifixion itself. Right? You've got the thief on one side, who confesses Jesus and is saved. You have the thief on the other side who derides Jesus and receives no such promise from Christ uh, as, as he gave to the penitent thief. The cross, in that instance, becomes a literal dividing line where, where you've got uh, a penitent on one side and someone who's not penitent on the other side, and you've got Christ right in the middle, and he's the dividing line. Uh, between the one who receives the promise and the one who is given no promise. The promised return of Christ works ex in exactly the same way. Right? We're supposed to wish for, you know, desire, the second coming of Christ because we have all of these promises connected to that. Right? You read the end of Revelation and how we see the, uh, we see the arrival of the new heavens and the new earth. We see... Um, man getting to live in God's presence, how there are no more tears, no more suffering. Uh, we're all basically living in, uh, in the garden, as it were. Right? The, the picture of heaven that we're given at the end of Revelation is, is a sim it's a picture of a garden. And yet, this, you know, the return of Christ is not just the fulfillment of promises, something that we look forward to, it is also inherently a threat for those who will not repent and who will not obey. This is the point that Peter makes in 2 Peter chapter 3. Remember, he, uh, he's fighting against these false teachers who, uh, one of the things that they're teaching is basically the second coming is never going to happen. Right? Ever since the beginning of the world, everything's been proceeding as it always has. Nothing's going to change. And... Peter says, no, the Lord is going to come again. And there's a reason why he hasn't yet. He tells us this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. All right, so you see the, the tension that's there in the second coming. Uh, Peter says that God is holding back on it, uh, that God has not sent his Son again in glory to judge the living and the dead, because he's giving us another chance, as it were. Um, he is, Peter says, he is patient towards us, uh, to specifically towards those who have not yet repented. He is patient. He doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So you've got that desire on the one hand, that all should reach repentance. And then on the other hand, you have this reality that eventually... God's going to pull the trigger, as it were. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away with a roar. Everything's going to be exposed. 
right? Everything's going to be burned away. The earth and the works that are done on it, Peter says. So when we're asking for the Lord's swift return, what are we asking for? Well, we're asking for both of those things. In fact, Peter himself uh, encourages us to hasten the day. Uh, he says later on in, there in 2 Peter chapter 3, we're asking for the repentance of all who have rejected God. We're also asking for the Lord's judgment to occur, both of those things at once. This tension between desiring that none should perish and desiring God's judgment against, against the wicked is absolutely baked into the faith at a fundamental level. It's baked into the cross. It's baked into the second coming. And this is nothing new, by the way. Right? This has its roots in the law. Um, we, we read the roots of this in Leviticus chapter 19, beginning in verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but... You shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. All right, so we find a dual warning in that. We're not to hate our brothers. We're not to take vengeance on them. But we are supposed to reason with people. Right? The, the law says, reason frankly with your neighbor. If you see your neighbor doing evil, try to talk him out of it, lest you incur sin because of him, the law says. All right, so we, we find the root of that dual concern right there in the law of Moses. Um, that we're not supposed to, to wish harm on anybody, but at the same time we are to fear the judgment of God and recognize that the judgment of God comes down on sinners both us and others. Um, we find this impulse in the prophets as well. Um, if you turn to Jeremiah chapter 18, beginning in verse 19, we read a prayer of Jeremiah's. And Jeremiah offers several of these prayers in this section um, of the book, where we find this tension on full display. Um, it's, he expresses it quite briefly in Jeremiah 18, verse 19. Hear me, O Lord, and listen to the voice of my adversaries. Should good be repaid with evil? Yet they have dug a pit for my life. Remember how I stood before you to speak good for them, to turn away your wrath from them. Therefore deliver up their children to famine. Give them over to the power of the sword. Let their wives become childless and widowed. May their men meet death by pestilence. Their youths be struck down by the sword in battle. May a cry be heard from their houses when you bring the plunderer suddenly upon them. For they have dug a pit to take me and laid snares for my feet. Yet you, O Lord, know all their plotting to kill me. Forgive not their iniquity, nor blot out their sin from your sight. Let them be overthrown before you. Deal with them in the time of your anger. So in one, in one verse, Jeremiah talks about how he has interceded for these people, how he has spoken for them, how he has spoken out to spare them from the Lord's wrath. And in the very next verse, he begins laying a whole series of curses against them, because of what they have done. Right, so we find both of those things going on in this one prayer, practically in the same breath. So we should understand the imprecatory psalms in this way. It's not ideal for God's enemies to experience God's judgment. It would be better for them to abandon their wickedness, to repent and return to the Lord. We should pray for that. But everything is conditional on repentance. And it is appropriate for us to also acknowledge and accept and even call down the Lord's judgment on people who refuse to repent. And here's why it's appropriate. Like we saw in 2 Peter chapter 3, God desires all men everywhere to repent. But we see later in that chapter that Peter encourages us to hasten the day of the Lord's return, like we mentioned earlier. God will send his son in judgment. And he gives us lots of second chances between now and then. But someday he's going to say, enough. 
and there's going to be no more chances. So here's the question for us. Do we trust God's judgment to make that call? Do we trust that whenever God pulls that trigger, as it were, it will be done righteously? Right? That everyone who is still alive is, I mean, they're there's no more use in giving them chances to repent, right? Whenever God makes that decision, he'll have made that decision, right? There's no more repenting to be done. And whoever is, whoever incurs the wrath of God, right? do we trust that that has all happened righteously, or are we going to try to stand as moral judges over and against the Almighty God? That is how we should understand the imprecatory psalms. They are not just us getting mad, or Israel getting mad at people and laying down curses on them. They are a statement of our trust in the righteousness of God's judgments. And that's why the imprecatory psalms are important for us, because we need to trust not only in God's promise, but also in his righteousness, particularly in how he exercises his judgment, how he dispenses his wrath. However God wants to do it, it is just. And the imprecatory psalms help us to get comfortable with that. So let's go ahead and turn our attention to the imprecatory psalms. The first imprecatory psalm that we're going to look at this week is Psalm 58. So let's turn there together. Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No. In your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or, the, or of the cunning enchanter. O God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. Now, there's some pretty grisly stuff in that, stuff that might make us uncomfortable, but I think overall, Psalm 58 uh, as a curse is relatively easy for us to palate. Uh, because first off, there's this matter of who's being cursed. Uh, now, it depends on how your English translation renders the word elim. Uh, the ESV renders it gods, like we saw at the beginning of our reading. So that the curse is against spiritual beings who have abused their power for injustice. And this is, in my opinion, this is probably the correct way to understand the psalm, since the elim um, at the beginning of the psalm are contrasted over and against Elohim at the end of the psalm. All right, the Elim at the beginning failed to judge the sons of man uprightly, whereas the psalmist confesses at the end, surely there is a God, surely there is Elohim who judges the earth. Now, your English Bible might render it a different way, like mighty lords or mighty men, uh, making the psalm an imprecation against unjust rulers. And it's, it's the same, the basic idea of the psalm hasn't changed. Um, the difference is really who's in charge of things on earth. Is it human rulers or spiritual forces of darkness? In reality, the answer to that is yes. Like, we recognize that there are earthly princes. There are earthly rulers who are responsible for justice on earth. And we also recognize that there are spiritual powers, right? Like we've studied about in various places. I think most recently in Ephesians, um, in talking about putting on the whole armor of God. Um, if there are these, these spiritual forces you know, acting behind the scenes who are in control of things. Regardless of the answer, whether we're talking about these spiritual forces or heavenly, or sorry, earthly rulers, the psalmist says they're doing a terrible job at it. 
right? And we can look around and agree, I hope, wholeheartedly with the psalmist that, yes, justice is, justice is scarce these days as it has always been. And thankfully, God is going to make things right. He's not going to let this stand forever. And the curses of Psalm 58 express just how thoroughly and relentlessly God is going to undo the wrongs of these oppressors. All right, he says, you know, the psalmist says, let them vanish like water that runs away. When he aims his arrows, let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime, like the stillborn child who never sees the sun. Sooner than your pots can feel the heat of thorns, whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. All right, so the Lord is going to deal with this thoroughly. But perhaps, and all of that, I think, should be palatable to us. Right? When we see powerful people abusing their position, or when we, especially if we identify this as being aimed at, at dark spiritual forces, um, I, I think all of that should be palatable to us. Where it might become more difficult for us is when we hit verse 10. Um, in reading the glee with which the psalmist uh, revels in their destruction, in which he says, we will revel in their destruction. Right? The psalmist says, the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. And again, that that might make some of us uncomfortable. If it strikes us as grisly, though, and if it strikes us as being counter to things that we have read in the New Testament, remember the plea of the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. The martyrs plea to God in John's vision, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And at the end of the book of Revelation, there's a celebration that takes place. Uh, you look at the first two verses of Revelation 19 and how you know, everybody in heaven's coming together and there's this, uh, this outcry of joy, hallelujah, because God has judged the, these evil forces on the earth. Um, God has av avenged the blood of his saints. And so this isn't something that we just see cons confined to the Old Testament or just to these psalms. It's something that breaks out all over the place, including in the New Testament, including in this vision of how God is going to make all things right in the end. So like we've said, these, these imprecations are there to teach us to trust in God's righteous judgment. So let's turn our attention now to singing Psalm 58. Now, this is where this is where looking at the Psalms is, I think, really beneficial to us, because in our week-to-week -week worship, I don't think we ever sing an imprecation. It's it's rare that we sing an imprecation, uh, or at least even that we that we internalize it as an imprecation. Um, and we have all of these. You know, we have all of these examples in the scripture of these various curses, um, wishing for God's judgment to come down against the wicked, for things to be made right. And so I think it's useful for us to expand our horizons a bit in the things that we typically sing. So the adaptation that we're going to be singing this week, I, I did some digging around, and probably the most. Um, satisfactory adaptation that I found. It was actually written by the famous Isaac Watts. All right, and we're familiar with Watts. He's written a ton of hymns in our hymnals. Um, he's a big, big name from the, uh, the early and mid 18th century in England. And he, I actually didn't know this before uh, studying for, for this series, but Isaac Watts actually did his own metrical adaptation of the Psalms. Now, it's not a full Psalter, um, so there are, there are several psalms that he omitted, um, and it is, in a lot of ways, it's a paraphrase. Um, in fact, his title for his Psalter was something like, The Psalms of David Imitated in the Language of the New Testament, if I remember correctly. Um, so he's, you can just see in the title, he's, he's taking, he has a certain agenda with the Psalms. Um, he is 
reading some New Testament language and New Testament principles back into the Psalms. And he does this really, really clearly in a lot of places, like his adaptation of Psalm 2. Um, he has it explicitly talking about Christ. We understand Psalm 2 to be a messianic psalm, um, but when Psalm 2 was written, you, you get the sense that the original author had in mind that he was talking about the King of Israel and not the Messiah of God. Um, Isaac Watts says, well, look, if, if we're going to read the Psalms as Christians, let's just go ahead and read Christianity into the Psalms. So in places you'll see that his adaptation is a little loose, and you'll see that in Psalm 58 as well. Um, I think it's a very good adaptation, but there are some places where he tends to embellish. Uh, especially as we go through, you'll see his second verse of, uh, of his adaptation of Psalm 58 is almost entirely embellishment. Um, yeah, it's it's true. <laughs> it's it's true embellishment, um, but it's stuff that you look at that verse and you compare it to the psalm and you think, mm, I don't think Isaac Watts got that material from Psalm 58. So we're gonna go ahead and leave it in just for the sake of of teaching it. Um, if you decide that you you want to learn Psalm 58 and you want to omit that verse, certainly omit that verse. Uh, I've personally not decided whether I'm going to to keep it or omit it. There's some good stuff in it, you'll see in just a second. In fact, let's go ahead and jump into the lyrics of Isaac Watts's metrical adaptation of Psalm 58. Uh, we'll start in his verse 1. Judges who rule the world by laws, will ye despise the righteous cause when the injured poor before you stands? Dare ye condemn the righteous poor and let rich sinners scape secure while gold and greatness bribe your hands? Have ye forgot or never knew that God will judge the judges too? High in the heavens is justice reigns. Yet you invade the rights of God and send your bold decrees abroad to bind the conscience in your chains. A poisoned arrow is your tongue, the arrow sharp, the poison strong, and death attends where'er it wounds. You hear no counsels, cries, or tears, so the deaf adder stops her ears against the power of charming sounds. Break out their teeth, eternal God. Those teeth of lions died in blood, and crush the serpents in the dust. As empty chaff when whirlwinds rise, before the sweeping tempest flies, so let their bones and names be lost. The Almighty thunders from the sky, their grandeur melts, their titles die, as hills of snow dissolve and run, or snails that perish in their slime, or birds that come before their time, vain births that never see the sun. Thus shall the vengeance of the Lord safety and joy to saints afford, and all that hear shall join and say, Sure there's a God that rules on high, a God that hears his children cry, and will their sufferings repay. All right, so Watts was, uh, is, is, so in his own day, he was reckoned as a decent to mediocre poet. Um, as far as his hymn writing goes, though, I've always thought Watts was pretty solid. And I think his poetry for Psalm 58 is really good. He, um, as we were reading along, you'll notice that that, adaptation sounds different from a lot of the adaptations that we have looked at so far in this series um, because Watts decided that he didn't want to just stick to just well you've probably noticed in the Scottish Psalter especially um, almost everything is adapted to the common meter so that it can be a challenge to make these adaptations sound different from each other so Watts took it upon himself to you know, flex his poetic, his metrical muscle a little bit. Um, now, one challenge to that is that this adaptation of Psalm 58 is written in a, a different meter, a meter that we have not sung before together in this series. In fact, I'll pull the lyrics back up, and you can see that instead of, instead of a quatrain, excuse me, instead of a four-line stanza, we're given a six-line stanza. Um, and so it's not even, you know, we're, we're used to either common meter or long meter, so those are four-line stanzas, or double of those meters, so common meter double or long meter double, which would be an eight-line stanza. 
What we're looking at here is a six line stanza and uh, each line is eight syllables. So in that it is, it's like long meter with all eight syllable lines. Um, but you'll notice it's, it's meant to be taken in pairs. So if you look at the first three lines, um, well, okay, I think it would be easier to look at this in terms of rhyme scheme. All right, so you look at the first two lines. Um, they rhyme with each other. Judges who rule the world by laws, will ye despise the righteous cause? All right, so in, uh, in poetic parlance, we would, we would call that AA. All right, so the first line has um, a particular rhyming syllable, and the second line has the exact same rhyme. So the first two lines rhyme with each other, A-A. Then you go to the third line, when the injured poor before you stands. All right, that's a completely different, right? It doesn't, stands doesn't rhyme with laws or cause. So we'll call that B. Well, then you go to the fourth line, dare ye condemn the righteous poor. And poor doesn't rhyme with stands or with cause or laws. And so we have yet another, we'll call that C. So dare ye condemn the righteous poor and let, the, and let rich sinners scape secure. All right, so there we have another rhyme. So another C line. And then finally in the sixth line of the stanza, while gold and greatness bribe your hands, Hands rhymes with stands, and so now we're back to a B. So the rhyme scheme that we're looking at is A-A-B-C-C-B, um, which is not something that we've, I think, seen before in our adaptations. Uh, so what Watts is doing is he's, he's giving us just a little bit of sophistication in the way that he is writing these adaptations. Um, the difficulty in that, though, is finding a tune to sing it to. Now, we've got, if we pull out uh, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, um, we have a common 888-888 uh, tune that you can also find in, um, you can find it in Hymns for Worship, possibly in uh, Sacred Selections. Excuse me, I forgot to check. Um, we saw thee not. Um in, uh, in Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs, number 197. Uh, that's really the only super common tune that we have. Uh, now, there are some other tunes available to us, though, particularly in Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs, that we're going to avail ourselves of. Um, it just so happens that C.E. Couchman really loves to write in 888-888. I don't know if that's a conscious choice or just an intuitive one, but she's written, oh, I, I think, four or five different tunes that we have in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that are in that meter. Um, if, you're, if you're not in the Churches of Christ, you might not be familiar uh, with C.E. Couchman. She's, she's a prolific hymn writer in our circles. Um, and one of her tunes she wrote back in 2003, I think fits the tenor of Psalm 58 perfectly. Um, it is, in Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs, it is number 242. The title of the hymn is Almighty God Beyond the Veil. Um, and I will put a link down in the description. Symphonia recorded um, this hymn for one of their CDs um, way back in the day, and so I'll put a link to that recording uh, down in the description and possibly in the cards if I remember to go back and do that. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can go access that. Uh, listen to the whole thing in four-part harmony. Listen to it as often as you want. Listen to it sung better than I'm about to sing it to you. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, beautiful, moving hymn. Almighty God Beyond the Veil is worth your learning in and of itself. The tune is beautiful as well, uh, very moving, and like I said, I think it really fits um, the, the mood of Psalm 58. So let's go ahead and we'll pull the lyrics back up, and let's sing Psalm 58 to the tune of Almighty God Beyond the Veil. Judges who rule the world by laws, will ye despise the righteous cause? 
When the injured poor before you stands, dare ye condemn the righteous poor, the righteous poor, and let rich sinners escape secure, while gold and greatness bribe your hands. Have ye for God or never knew that God will judge the judges too? I in the heavens is justice reigns, yet you invade the rights of God, the rights of God, and send your bold decrees abroad to bind the conscience in your chains. A poisoned arrow is your tongue, the arrow sharp, the poison strong. And death attends where'er it wounds you, hear no counsels, cries or tears, no cries or tears, so the deaf adder stops her ears. Against the power of charming sounds. Break out their teeth, eternal God, those teeth of lions dyed in blood. And crush the serpents in the dust as empty chaff when whirlwinds rise, when whirlwinds rise before the sweeping tempest flies. So let their bones and names be lost. The almighty thunders from the sky, their grandeur melts, their titles die. As hills of snow dissolve and run, or snails that perish in their slime, die in their slime, or birds that come before their time, vain births that never see the sun. Thus shall the vengeance of the Lord safety and joy to saints afford. And all that here shall join and say, Sure, there's a God that rules on high, God rules on high, a God that hears his children cry, and will their sufferings repay. All right, the next psalm that we're going to look at this week is Psalm 137, and this one can be harder to fathom. In fact, I think a lot of people struggle with this psalm. Uh, let's go ahead and read it together. By the waters of Babylon there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem. How they said, Lay it bare, lay it bare, down to its foundations. O oh, daughter of Babylon, doomed to be destroyed, blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Now, you will sometimes hear people say that the distinction between an appropriate curse and a sinful curse is the difference between seeking justice and seeking vengeance. And you'll sometimes hear people say that appropriate curses are aimed at the enemies of God. Right? The psalmists only get mad at people who are unrighteous and who offend God. The sinful curses are aimed at personal enemies, and you just you don't see the psalmists aim their curses at their personal enemies. And 
as a prudential matter, whenever we are considering how we are to use this kind of language and these kinds of sentiments, I think that those are good guide rails, guard rails rather, um, for making sure that we don't go into something that's that's sinful, that's inappropriate. And yet, well, I, in fact, let's let's go even further. Let's say besides besides saying that there's something to that idea, right? That um, that you even see that I, that set of ideas expressed, I think, fairly convincingly in Psalm 58. Right? I think you could uh, interpret Psalm 58 as just about how the psalmist is writing against God's enemies, not his own personal enemies, and how he is seeking justice and not vengeance for something that has happened to him. But when we hit Psalm 137, all of that goes right out the window. Psalm 37 looks at those, those rules of imprecatory psalms, so-called, and says hogwash. Psalm 137. To say that Psalm 137 blurs the lines is, ah, that's a drastic understatement. Because this is a psalm of vengeance. This is a psalm where the psalmist himself has been deeply wronged by his adversaries. And he wants it made right. And part of it being made right is his adversaries suffering what he has suffered. And he's again it's these aren't just the adversaries of god the context for this this is you know, all right so by the by the waters of babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered zion this is a psalm of captivity now you read the prophets who's who do we know is using babylon who's using nebuchadnezzar Whose side, quote-unquote, is Babylon on? At least from the prophet's perspective, they're God's instrument. God tells Habakkuk, I am going to use the Chaldeans to judge Judea. Um, now, he also says, I'm going to judge the Chaldeans, too, because they're a, a wicked, despicable people. They're going to get destroyed, too. But in this context, I think it's a stretch. Like in the context of Psalm 137, it's a stretch to say, oh, the psalmist, he is, he's just concerned with who God's enemies are. Who do you think, again, who do you think picked Babylon? God did. They're not acting contrary to God. They did exactly what God wanted them to do in taking Judah captive. Who is the psalmist you know, who who have these people sinned against? Who is the psalmist mad for? The psalmist is not mad for God. Right? If you're reading Psalm 137 and and you're thinking, oh, the psalmist he's just mad for God, you've got to take the blinders off. Be be honest with the text. The psalmist is angry for himself, for his own people, for his nation. How could I sing the songs of Zion in a foreign land, the psalmist asks, asks. If I were to forget Jerusalem, may I forget my skill. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth, the psalmist says. It's all aimed at himself. And the psalm ends with, again, one of the most strident expressions of personal vengeance that you can ask for in Scripture. Blessed shall he be who repays you what you have done to us. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. So let's dig into this psalm a little bit and understand exactly what's going on here and why, you know, why this gets preserved for us. Why it's preserved for Israel and used in their worship. 
why it's preserved for us and is an option for us to use in our worship. There is a, at the outset of the psalm, excuse me, the, well, I mean, really the whole psalm is this way. Psalm 137 is, is the point where the imprecatory psalms overlap the lament psalms. And you'll find that that's pretty common with the imprecations that you read in the book of Psalms. There's a lot of sadness behind these curses. And you find this deep, deep sadness pervading Psalm 137. And it's a personal sadness. These people have had everything taken from them. They've been dragged off into captivity. Their captors are mocking them. They're mocking their suffering. The interesting thing about Psalm 137 is that the psalmist, before invoking a curse against his adversaries, invokes a curse against himself. Right? He says, you know, if, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. If he were to forget the promised land, let him be cursed. He's not about to sing any of the songs that memorialize his home for these despicable men. But he is going to keep the memory of his home alive in some other way. And it's at this point where the psalmist turns his cursing against his captors. And again, we can't view this as anything other than deeply personal. He asks for vengeance against Edom for what they've done to Judah. He asks for vengeance against Babylon. And I will read it again. Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. This is, this is the way that the psalmist is framing things. Justice is going to be done to Babylon, but what justice is going to look like is that the same thing is going to be done to Babylon as was done to Judah. It's going to be revenge. And what exactly has been done to Judah? We've, we've answered that in a very broad, generic sense. Right? They've had their homeland taken from them. They've been taken off into captivity. But we learn in the final verse of the psalm what exactly it is that Babylon has done that needs repaying. Right? We have to read those verses together, I think. The final verse of Psalm 137 doesn't just come out of nowhere. It follows up on this, this, this wish, Blessed shall he be who repays you with what you have done to us. And Psalm 137 verse 9 is one of the most infamous verses in Scripture. Blessed shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. It is horrifically violent, and it shocks us to, seeing, to see this kind of thing coming out of the psalmist's mouth and then to be preserved for the use of all the saints. The psalmist is telling us, though, what needs to be repaid. The psalmist himself very likely watched his own young son or daughter be put to death in this way that he's talking about in Psalm 137 verse 9. Now, as, as far as analyzing the psalm goes, I'm, I'm still going to leave it at that. Um, I don't think the psalm itself invites us to try to sweep it under the rug or make it arrive at some kind of happy conclusion you know, to resolve what's going on. The, the value of the psalm is the psalm itself. So now is as good a point as any to talk about metrical adaptations of this psalm. Our English adaptations of Psalm 137 typically fall into a couple of different categories. Most of our adaptations shy away from this last verse. Um, the one that we're going to sing today 
falls into that camp. You'll see when we come to the hymn's final verse that the uh, the curse of Psalm 137 verse 9 has been weakened by generalizing it. You'll see in just a minute um, how they've generalized it. Um, there are a few adaptations, though, that go in the other direction. They go all in with the curse of verse 9. Uh, such as the adaptation written by Nicholas Brady and Nahum Tate um, for their 1696 new version of the Psalter. Um, so they, they did an update of the Psalter in 1696, uh, wrote all of their own adaptations of the Psalms. Um, they, like Watts, wanted to try to move away from a lot of the common meter uh, that was done. And I'll just go ahead and I'll show you their... Uh, their adaptation of Psalm 137, verse 9. Well, actually, hold on just a second. Um, so I flash it up on the screen there for a second, those of you that watch it on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, I want to explain a little bit of what they've done here. In Hebrew, you've got two short lines of poetry here. Um, it's a very brief passage that they take. And they have to take those two short lines of Hebrew poetry in Psalm 137, verse 9, and stretch them out to fill four lines of English long meter. So 16 syllables. Um, I'm sorry, rather, that should be 32 syllables. Um, and that's how they ended up with this adaptation. Thrice blessed who with just rage possessed and deaf to all the parents' moans shall snatch thy infants from the breast and dash their heads against the stones. So they've, they have taken what was already a grisly uh, curse in Psalm 137, verse 9, and embellish it even further to make it fit the meter. Um, it's, I have not found a good adaptation of Psalm 137 that handles that curse um, in a way that's completely fair to what the scriptures themselves say. Again, they either kind of downplay it, or like Brady and Tate, they, they crank it up to 11. So the adaptation that we're going to look at today um, appears in the 1976 Psalter Hymnal, and it is written also in long meter. Um, and it, well, let's go ahead and read the lyrics first. They've, uh, they've reduced it from nine verses to six. They've not taken any material out. Um, it's just the meter allows them to fit in the material in six verses. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about the tune that we can sing it to. So verse one. By Babel's streams we sat and wept, for memory still to Zion clung. The winds alone our harp strings swept, that on the drooping willows hung. Verse 2. There our rude captors flushed with pride, a song required to mock, us, uh, to mock our wrongs. Our spoilers called for mirth and cried, Come, sing us one of Zion's songs. Verse 3. Not songs, but sighs to us belong when Zion's walls and ruin lie. How shall we sing Jehovah's song while in an alien land we die? Verse 4. O Zion fair, God's holy hill, wherein our God delights to dwell, let my right hand forget its skill if I forget to love you well. Verse 5. If I do not remember you, then let my tongue from singing cease. If any joy within my view be dear as Zion's joy and peace. Verse 6, the final verse. Remember, Lord, the dreadful day of Zion's cruel overthrow. How happy he who shall repay the bitter hatred of her foe. All right, and so you can see how the curse has been generalized. Um, it doesn't mention Babylon or Edom specifically doesn't mention the specific crime that is to be repaid. Just generically, remember the dreadful day of Zion's cruel overthrow, and how happy he who shall repay the bitter hatred of her foe. It doesn't specify what form that bitter hatred took in the captivity. So, um, the... Now, I found this in the... 
the new Psalter that is coming out this November, um, and they have set this to uh, the tune Olive's Brow. Um, you know, we, we know that tune very well. Tis midnight and on Olive's brow is the hymn that we sing that to. Um, and I think that, again, the tune fits the tenor of the psalm here. And it's a, again, it's a common tune for us. So I'm not going to include any, uh, any link down in the description for this. Um, you can look it up. You know, Tis Midnight and On Olive's Brow. It's in like every Church of Christ hymnal, um, including Sacred Selections. So you can look it up anywhere. Uh, let's go ahead and return to verse 1 and sing, By Babel streams we sat and wept. By babel streams we sat and wept, for memory still to Zion clung. The winds alone our harp strings swept, that on the drooping willow. Song. There are rude captors flushed with pride, a song required to mock our wrongs, our spoilers called for mirth and cried. Come sing us one of Zion's songs. Not songs but sighs to us belong. When Zion's walls in ruin lie, how shall we sing Jehovah's song while in an alien land we die? O Zion, fair God's holy hill, where in our God delights to dwell. Let my right hand forget its skill, if I forget to love you well. If I do not tongue from singing cease, if any joy within my view be dear as Zion's joy and peace. Remember, Lord, the dreadful of Zion's cruel overthrow. How happy he who shall repay the bitter hatred of her We'll wrap up there for this week. The call for this week is that God does patiently await your repentance and your obedience to him. But he's not going to wait forever. So we urge you to believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. We urge you to turn away from sin. We urge you to confess Jesus as Lord we urge you to be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins. Find a Church of Christ near you. Study the way with them. 
if you're in the, uh, the St. Petersburg, Florida area, we're the 14th Avenue Church of Christ, and we would be happy to study the way of Jesus with you uh, so that you can join in the promises of God and escape his wrath for sin, the share in the forgiveness that is offered through the blood of his Son. And the lesson for those of us who follow Jesus, who obey him, is to wait patiently for our Lord and to trust in his righteous judgment because he will set all things to rights. Uh, he will make everything that is wrong right. And so we look forward to that great day and we pray, Lord, send your son quickly. So until next week, I hope that you take care. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.